Professor Azadeh Ansari, uh, who's a relatively new faculty member in uh, ECE. Uh, so today it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Paul Rousseau. Uh, Paul got his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin and then did his PhD uh, at the University of Minnesota in chemistry and then did a postdoc at UMass in polymer physics. Um, he spent 30 years at uh, Louisiana State University uh, before coming to Georgia Tech in 2014. Uh, where he is the Hightower Chair in uh, Material Science and Engineering um, with an adjunct position in Chemistry and Biochemistry. And um, generally his research area is on what I would say broadly soft materials, um, but you'll see his title and abstract do not mention the word nanotechnology, nano anything, but don't be fooled, there's plenty of nanotechnology, I promise. <laughs> so, Paul. That's true. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, let's see, the best way for these is about where? Yeah. Good? Somewhere around there. Okay, and then I hooked that in a pocket anywhere. Well, thank you for attending. Uh, I've come to these lunches a lot of times, and I often wonder why. Why talks? Why come to them? Why give them? And we'll talk about that a little bit. And if you didn't get one of the little handouts, try to grab one. I apologize that they're on such so much paper. I forgot to ask the secretary to print them on double side, she could have reduced the font too, but <clears throat> anyway, uh, that's a, a good thing, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. So uh, of course the work I'll show you isn't anything that I do. Uh, I don't know what I do. I would say that I answer email, but my students would say no he doesn't. Um, <clears throat> um, so anyway. Uh, singling out probably the, what you'll see today, the people who have done the most are Dr. Cornelia Rozu and Xu Jin Zhang, who will be a PhD here, I don't know, within the year, certainly, I hope. Um, but why go to talks? Why do I go to these talks? Of course, there's the free pizza. That's a good thing. Um, but uh, I think mostly I go to get away <laughs> and to be alone with my thoughts. And uh, you know, maybe I, something osmosis through just accidentally and I learn something and it leads to some new thought. I don't know. Um, but this handout that I've given you is an uh, article by N. David Merman. Anybody know who Merman is? Merman is sort of like the uh, uh, Richard Feynman of upstate New York. He is a National Academy member in physics. <coughs> and he has a whole series of wonderful articles. Uh, and they often start with, uh, what's wrong with? Uh, one of my favorites is, what's wrong with those awards, you know? And that's really funny because you can read it if you don't know who he is. You never figure out, is he an award-winning guy or not? Uh, he is. Um, but this one is uh, about what's uh, wrong with those talks. And uh, what he says is, uh, you know, every talk I've ever attended in 40 years of going to talks has been too hard. So we'll endeavor not to do that. Uh, so there's no point in telling you to try to make it simple because if somebody could have done it, they would have. <laughs> so we'll, you know, we'll still try, okay? Um, and your, your goal uh, is to strive uh, to place as far as possible from the beginning of the, of the talk, uh, the grim moment when more than 90% of the audience is able to make sense out of less than 10% of what you're saying. <laughs> kind of a, a bad thing. So the best reason to lecture on your work is that it affords you the opportunity to rediscover why you did it. You know, we forget why that is. We forget in the middle of what's going on, uh, you know, the order that didn't come, the instrument that's broken, um, filling out uh, for the fourth time uh, my IEN uh, request to pay the things. And I say, we've paid it. And they say, no, you haven't. So <laughs> stuff like that happens. Uh, anyway, so you know, you do have the opportunity to just sort of rediscover why you did it, why we got excited in the first place. And he says, uh, this is funny, uh, there's always the risk you will not find an answer why you're doing it. Uh, what is there to capture the imagination uh, uh, of somebody who lacks your uh, specialized skills? And he says, give yourself a week. Well, I gave myself a weekend. But I spent most of it skiing, so, and I have a sore knee. The only reason I'm able to do this at all is that my knee was too sore to ski the third day, and so I was able to quote unquote prepare. All right, so what I will do at the beginning, since I think some of you don't know too much molecular things, is talk about proteins just in the most general of terms. 
Uh, so you have something to go on, at least you get imparted a little bit of knowledge about that. And then we'll move on to an example of a particular protein that is somehow affiliated with elm wilt. We have one that I know of, a beautiful American elm tree on this campus, and it seems to still be healthy, uh, but a lot of them are suffering. Uh, then we'll talk about how that protein can be used to encapsulate P3HT, which is one of the polymers used uh, for semiconductive type applications. And then we'll talk about mimicking that kind of response um, using uh, uh, synthetic type polymers. Okay, so very quickly a little bit about proteins. So, um, you know, uh, when the, I, I remember when the nano revolution came, it was in the mid-90s, right? Algar invented nanotechnology. Um, just ask him, he did. So, uh, well, the rest of us, many of us in the polymer field, in the protein field, was like, big deal. Uh, it's always been about nanotechnology. <laughs> uh, uh, you, to get all these functions that you see up there, enzyme catalysis, storage, movement, immunity, okay, to get the 90% of what cells do, uh, takes a molecule of a certain size and sophistication. And that size happens, begins happening really at the nano level. Okay, uh, so uh, I don't know, so it says that, uh, this is my uh, slide from one of my former colleagues, Vince Licata, back at LSU where I was. And I uh, liked his slides, so we're gonna use them. Um, but, uh, you know, it says that they perform uh, greater than 90% of the work of the cell. The only other thing I can think of that's not there is replication. And so I don't know about you guys, but uh, if you're spending more than 10% of your time replicating, good for you. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I don't think cells do either. I think it's really closer to 99% of what cells do is proteins. Okay, the rest is the replication part with DNA. Okay, so uh, the only reason, for example, to, to highlight one of these things, enzyme catalysis, you're eating this pizza and you're gonna burn it and nobody is gonna self-immolate here. Nobody's gonna go up in flame, we don't have to add a spark plug, we don't have to add any energy. And that's because the enzymes in your body are lowering that energy of activation to the point where you can burn that fuel at a comfortable 37 degrees centigrade, right? Very handy. All right, so just a little bit about the proteins. They're made up of amino acids, okay, which are chiral molecules, which means they don't have, they have a certain symmetry, we don't go into that. Uh, and there's, uh, I don't know, some 20 of them, naturally occurring ones, more than that. Um, and uh, they're all the same molecule uh, at the backbone level, across the backbone they're all the same. Uh, but the side chain, see this thing here is a hydrogen, whereas you look over on this one, it's a methyl group. And that's a different thing totally hydrogen versus methyl. So you have like these, uh, you know, 20, 25, whatever, choices of amino acids uh, that you can put together. And uh, to make a protein, you do have to put them together and form a peptide link. So there's a peptide link, one of them being formed, a bond being formed there. It's a pretty strong bond. It uh, has a particular kind of geometry to it. And uh, that's just a dimer, that's two amino acids together. If you want a little bit more function, uh, you can make this, here's a pentapeptide with tyrosine, glycine, glycine, phenylalanine, and leucine, I guess. Um, anyway, so uh, you can make these. And if you start thinking about it, um, if you have, so let's just say, uh, 20 natural amino acids just to make the math easy, each of those could be a choice of 20. So I got 20 for the first, times 20 for the second, times 20. Boy, I could make a lot of different, different proteins just by varying the sequence, okay? In fact, it basically it's an infinitum of possibilities of what you could make. And that's what attracts me to this kind of field, this possibility, the possibilities are endless. Of course, nature has made a lot of the ones that you need already, right? But uh, we could make other ones, additional ones, if we wanted. So that's kind of interesting. So now the language of it is that, you know, if they usually call them peptides if they're less than about 50. Okay, and that's a, you know, you can make that on a machine. We can now make those in a machine. Um, proteins are usually, you know, if they're bigger than 50 repeat units, 50 different amino acids or 50 repeat units, then we start calling it a protein for sure. That's kind of a 
a gray area there when they convert from peptides to proteins. Who cares? Um, primary sequence is what really determines it, the sequence of the amino acids. Well, one of the other things that can happen is that chain can grow to a certain size, and it can have this, uh, this group here, cysteine, on it, with the ends in SH, and if you oxidize that cysteine, you wind up with cysteine, and you have this disulfide link. And so that lets you cross-link two chains. You can actually connect two growing chains uh, like that. And in fact, they could be the same strand that just kind of came back onto itself and then gets cross-linked. That could happen. Okay, so here's an example of insulin, which was uh, sequenced about the time I was born, um, a little before that, I guess. And so we've uh, known how to make these sequence, how to determine these sequences for a long time. And you can see example here of uh, intra-strand disulfide link and an inter two inter-strand links. All right. The other thing you need to know is that these things fold in a certain way. They fold in a certain way, so the strands grow and they fold, and people worked out the energy map for what's likely to happen, and one of the things that's likely to happen is helix, and the other is called beta sheet, which we'll talk about now. So here's the helix, okay? So one of the things that the chains can do is sort of wrap themselves into this spiral staircase type of structure. Of course, that's a sort of extended structure once you do that. It's a sort of long extended structure, and it turns out it's very rigid, too, in terms of bending rigidity. It doesn't have much um, extensional modulus, but the bending modulus of that is pretty high as molecules go. And uh, so different representations of it are shown here. Here's a, the same thing, basically. This is looking down the helix from one end. It wraps around and around. So one of the things that, uh, another thing that, that you can get is a thing called a beta sheet. Okay, so this is ca sometimes called a pleated sheet. Does anybody know what pleated means? It means like you sort of iron in folds like a pleated skirt or something like that for those who remember wearing skirts. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, not that I ever wore one myself, but anyway, um, it's sort of a pleated structure can be obtained in this way. So here is a, a, a chain growing off in this direction and it has these kind of connections here which are held, and here's one that just sort of loops around and makes a fold. And these things are kind of uh, stiff and rigid and difficult to dissolve. In. So if you take uh, bovine serum albumin, and you were to make it into an alpha helix, take the 584 residues. This is a, a protein that's very common in cows. You have it in you too, but yours is human serum albumin. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, if you were to take it and stretch it out, you know, put it in the helix, it would be about 90 nanometers long. Uh, if you were to take, uh, make a beta sheet one way and then pleat down the other way, just up here and then just fold it back, 200 nanometers. What it actually is is much more compact. Actually, I think this number is wrong. I've got to talk, I think I recalculate that. But, but it's certainly possible to have it be a much more comp uh, compact structure. And I know a lot of you, um, metals, you know, I was surprised coming to Georgia Tech. I'm trained as a chemist, and I'm in this material science department. And they, the amount of effort that they put into things like crystallography just blows my mind, you know. We're studying a barium difluoride, and we're studying trying to get the magnetic properties out of this and all these other things with these tiny little crystals. Okay, but it's not often realized that, uh, you know, uh, big things make crystals too, and proteins can be crystallized, at least some of them. It's not an easy thing. Uh, the ones that we'll talk about are pretty difficult, but this is an example of a diffraction pattern. So imagine that your unit cell contains not something simple like barium and a couple of fluorines, but hundreds and hundreds of atoms, thousands of atoms. Okay, and so you can actually work out the locations of all of those, okay, and obtain structures. All right, so we're ready. That's your introduction to proteins. We're ready now to talk about this example of one particular protein, the Elmwilt protein, okay? Uh, and uh, it's actually a, a member of a class of proteins called hydrophobins. And uh, hydrophobins, uh, we think, are nature's most surface active proteins. Okay, so surface active means that they go to a surface. And they do that to minimize the uh, uh, interaction energy of one part of the molecule with the water. 
Okay, so the hydrophobins, uh, there seem to be about 60 or 70 of them. I'm not sure we have an exact count. Um, the one of them that has been crystallized, there's only a few that have been crystallized, one of them is shown. And what you need to know is that the R groups uh, down at the bottom of it are hydrophobic, means that they don't want to be near water. And the rest of them are hydrophilic, meaning that they do want to be water. And you see some disulfide links in here holding this thing together. This is not a very large protein. And molecular weights are like 10,000 for the hydrophobins. That's not very big. Okay? But they all have this conserved pattern of the disulfide bonds here. Okay, eight cysteines, four disulfide links. And in a small molecule, that much stuff holding things together is kind of uh, rare. So they're very rugged little molecules. You can heat them, you can beat them, you can just let them sit in solution in the presence of other bugs that don't eat them. You can do all sorts of stuff, and they just remain functional for a very long time. And uh, they always have one side hydrophobic and the other side hydrophilic. Okay, and so in a way, there are like little nature's Janus, nature's little Janus particles. Some of you work very hard to get one side of a particle different than the other side, but nature does it in these hydrophobins. Okay, and like I said, they're they're made of mushrooms. Mushrooms make them. Other things make them um, from that family. Um, this is a picture of some mushrooms in a New York store I just took to send to my son because he gets, he's revolted at the sight of mushrooms actually. Um, and this one, speaking of revolting, uh, I came out of the first center, you know, first place, uh, George's idea of dining. Um, and uh, well, I saw this piece of insulation foam. I thought it was some construction foam they left over on the ground. I was going to go pick it up and throw it into the garbage because it looked like a piece of that great stuff foam. You know, you've seen the construction foam. I thought I'd just pick that up. It looked trashy on the campus. And when I got there, it was a, a mushroom. And that's my foot in the image there. You get an idea of the size of these things. Well, one thing you know about mushrooms is they really sprout up. They boom. They just grow, right? So that much growth creates the uh, need for a lot of surface quickly. Okay? When you grow something that fast, you're creating a lot of new surface. So one of the reasons people think that mushrooms make hydrophobins is to lower the surface tension and make it easier for the surface to be generated. There are other reasons that people think they are formed, but okay. So I already kind of told you this. There are actually two, two kinds of hydrophobins, though. This is just showing the conserved pattern of disulfide links. Okay. Uh, this one is a picture of where I used to spend my summers um, in Minnesota. Uh, let's see, Protestants buried on this side, and uh, Catholics buried on that side. That's, uh, you know, they have a segregation issue there, too. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, look at the trees. These are all elm trees, and they are not healthy. You see them at the top, that their canopy is greatly diminished. And it looks like the Protestants are suffering more on this case. Um, anyway, um, the... The fact that this protein is made and is actually carried to the tree um, on a fungus, and the fungus is carried to the tree on a beetle, uh, that's the problem. And it's been implicated in the death of these trees. Uh, there are other factors that intervene, but uh, it's definitely true if you take this hydrophobin protein, the one that we deal with is called serratoomen, om means elm, okay? So serratoomen, um, is implicated. And if you take purified serrata omen and just place it near a growing elm seedling, it will die. So, I mean, it's definitely lethal to the trees. It's not clear that that means it's the only thing that's involved in the disease. I'll draw your attention to the way the wind is blowing here. You, obviously, it's summer. In the summer, the wind blows like that. From the south, if it was winter, it'd be blowing just as hard from the north, and it'd be really cold. <laughs> All right, uh, well, if you take some of this serrato omen protein and you purify it, and you just, it doesn't really dissolve in the usual sense, but you can put it in the presence of water, and you agitate slightly, you'll see that there are all these misshapen structures, okay, sort of cylindrical type structures here. This is in the presence of just, you know, 
a water solution with air on the top, and you just sort of agitate slightly, and you'll get these things. Okay, and so uh, actually, uh, those are bubbles, and you all know that bubbles are round. Bubbles are round to minimize the surface tension, right? But these are bubbles that clearly are not round, and it seems like a really remarkable thing until you think differently. Imagine a straw, a plastic straw, all right? And I pinch off both ends. Well, I've made a bubble, right? But it's still not going to be round. Why? Because the surface of it is a solid. Right? Basically, it's a plastic solid. So what this is really telling us is that the stratoomen molecules go to a surface, the air-water interface, and get to be solid-like, solid-like at that interface. Now, you could go instead to a an water-oil interface. And here we've taken oil, I think cyclohexane, I can't remember. And we've added a little dye to make it very visible. Okay? And you again get these sort of misshapen structures. Okay? This, so if the ceratoalmon was behaving as a fluid interface, that would have to be round. Well, you can force it to be round. You can sonicate it, and then that adds enough energy, and it makes it round. In this case, we've actually trapped the polymer, and the polymer has gelled. If you can see carefully enough here, you can see that these structures are really round, but one half of them is filled with polymer that's kind of phase separated out and gelled. All right, so understanding these bubbles has been sort of a lot of fun to, for us to try to do. And let's see, I think here, if I go, I think I have to hit escape, and then if I'm very lucky, I'll be able to make this go. Um, let's assume that it's going to go when I get there. I've got to set it up first. This is a picture of some of these uh, air bubbles, cylindrical air bubbles. And what's being plotted here is the pressure over the solution. So this is starting off at atmospheric pressure, and we're going to go down in pressure. Okay? So what happens to a bubble if I reduce the air pressure above it? It should expand, right? So you'll see that they expand, and then we're going to go down, 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 and then we'll come back up, and you'll see some funny things happen. All right, let's hope that it really plays. It's playing. Okay, good. Now we're going down in pressure. See the plot on the right is going down. And a lot of them have converted to round bubbles. Uh, some of them are staying. And the pressures, now we're going to start the pressure coming back up. All right. And uh, these ones are about, the little ones are about to disappear. Look at this one here, though. I can't see. Look at the top. Watch very closely and see if you don't get a familiar shape. Donuts, right there. Okay? Air filled donuts. It's a dream come true. Very few calories. Um, so I always have a trouble stopping it at the right point, so I will. Just go to the next slide, which shows it. See, an air-filled donut. Now, sometimes you—I don't know what you call those little donuts that are like figure eights. You know, they taste out a crawler or something. Anyway, sometimes you can get those. It's kind of interesting. Um, uh, that's a new structure uh, that we do not know why that happens. And some people here are trying to help us understand that from a mechanical engineering point of view, uh, why that can happen. And what I would appreciate, especially from you guys, uh, who all have young creative minds, most of you, um, is what the hell would we do with an air-filled donut? Okay, it's an interesting natural phenomenon. Uh, we have some ideas. Uh, certainly it's a high surface area compared to most other shapes. That's nice. Uh, possibly as image contrast. I was talking to somebody this weekend on the ski trails about filling these here with a reactive gas and solidifying them. Okay, you can talk about gelling things outside of them, and then they would have sort of a different property in terms of acoustic transparency that might be interesting to some people. But we just need more applications. Well, it turns out Xu Zhang has gotten pretty good at making these things, and they're stable for a pretty long time, day, day or more. Uh, and uh, so now it becomes incumbent upon us to try to understand the mechanical properties of that surface. So this is a, a, a picture from a paper that's just been accepted 
um, that uh, shows how we go about measuring the mechanical properties of those bubbles. Okay? And so, so let me set this up a little bit. Here on the left, there's a pump, and it can oscillate, you know, pulsing pump. Pressure, less pressure, pressure, less pressure. Oscillate the pressure. And it feeds a kind of a syringe, you could think of it as, with a very fine tip, about 40 microns, I think. And um, you push that inside this reservoir that has uh, the solution that contains the uh, proteins. The proteins are in this solution. And you can see there the, the bubble. And here is an actual picture of it taken under a microscope. All this is under a microscope. Okay? And you can just sit there, and the bubble will change its shape because the protein is coming to it. Okay? It's diffusing to it from the solution. Or you can oscillate and make the bubble expand and contract and expand and contract. And you're sort of perturbing it just like you would in a rheometer. So this is really a surface rheometer to measure the properties of this film. Okay. This is a sort of another picture of what's going on here. So here's a picture of a hydrophobin, the egg-shaped particles with a green hydrophobic regime. Those are going to align near air or oil. I forgot to tell you back on this one. Here we've got it filled with air, but you could just as easily put oil in there. Uh, and uh, here's a picture of the uh, bubble at the tip. And you're going along. And you're, not, you're just sitting there and letting the bubble sit there. And then we turn on and off the oscillations. And you can see pressure oscillations and size oscillations that go with this. And you can back out from all of this information about the mechanical properties of this tiny little bubble. So here is an example of static mode, no oscillating. The pump is switched off. It's just sitting there. And we're just observing changes to the shape of the bubble. And this is the surface energy. Here, oops, where did my, here we go. Wow, okay. We're looking at the surface energy, uh, and it just goes down over a period of about an hour. It takes the uh, proteins about an hour to diffuse to the surface there and uh, change the shape, and that's how we get the, inf the information about the surface tension. And the inset here, this little inset up here, the inset shows you uh, what would happen, what happens if you uh, rinse all the protein out of the solution. Remember, the protein is in this reservoir, and you can rinse it out and just put in water. And if you do that at early times, after it's only been uh, maybe uh, 800 seconds of there, something like that, uh, it's reversible. The surface tension bounces back up a little bit. But if you wait and try that later, it doesn't happen. It doesn't come back up. So what happens is that the proteins go to this interface and somehow strengthen and become solids. Okay. Uh, this is a kind of a compound picture of the sort of what else goes on here, um, just to give you an idea of how this works. The black trace up there is the uh, that is the uh, surface tension. And you can think about it, that as the pressure being applied to the system, if you want. And the pink trace is the radius. And uh, what we show down here at the lower left is a zoom. We just zoom that, and you can see the oscillations that are turned on during this time. And, you, and what you see is that at early times, um, very small surface pressures uh, result in very big radius changes. So small black curve oscillations are big pink curve oscillations. So, you know, even a little bit of pressure change results in a great big change in the radius of the bubble, which means that it's soft, right? And then over a period of time, it hardens. See, at the end of this curve here, we find that large pressure oscillations uh, are no longer able to produce anything that we can see in terms of uh, si change in size. So now the material is, has gotten hard. And you can back out from this the dilatational modulus of this protein. You see the solid-like character of this protein. Okay. Well, you can repeat all that in the presence of oil or air. Okay. So you can have air bubbles or oil 
bubbles or blobs. Um, and what you see is that they are different. Uh, in the presence of air, there's this sort of long gestation period here where nothing really happens, and then boom, it starts to solidify. Whereas in the presence of oil, uh, um, sort of immediately you start getting an increase and uh, sort of slowly solidifies, and it never gets as strong. See, there's a different scale here for the red curve than there is for the blue curve. So the oil films just never seem to get as strong as the uh, blue curves. But having said that, I will tell you that we think uh, either of these is sort of a lower bound on the actual strength. And people have done this with other proteins a lot, uh, but these are record-setting results. These are the stiffest proteins that people have measured. They are really quite amazing. Um, so uh, we could start asking things like, um, is there a molecular explanation for this? Is there something going on in the conformation of the protein that changes in that conformation? So you could ask that question. And it turns out that one way to interpret the results is that you know, we, can, we can expose a protein to ethanol, uh, we can heat it, we can do different salts, we can do all these things, but the one thing that really seems to get its attention is to give it oil, okay? So it's almost as if the oil is there and sort of lubricating the surface. So this, is a protein that's going to a surface and creating a kind of a, a rigid type structure. And in the presence of oil, it's a little bit lubricated. It starts happening right away without the long gestation period. And it seems also to asso be associated with conformational changes in the protein. This is a circular dichroism result here. This is one way that we use to follow protein. Well, can any of this be used for material science? Okay. One thing that you can do is you can put in as your oil component, some simple polymer like polystyrene. So if you wanted to have polystyrene particles with a very high surface area, uh, you could do them. You could polymerize them inside of these uh, bubbles, and that's what's going on there. Okay. Uh, this one uh, is an uh, application to, to oil film. Okay. So here we let them meet. I think that's actually engine oil there at the interface, and you get an idea of how strong these little surfaces are, that they bag the oil, almost they just bag it up like that, okay? See, that's not a normal thing to happen inside of oil meets water, okay? So now I've come around to this part of the talk. I've talked about proteins, so one example of a natural protein. Could we do something material science-y with it, okay? And in particular, can we do something of interest to others at Georgia Tech? So there's a big effort here in the semiconducting polymers, okay? And the uh, model polymer that's always used is, uh, often used, is uh, P3HT, poly-3-hexylthiophene, and there it is up there, that structure. And uh, it likes to, well, you, we would like it to line up, okay? The goal is to get them to line up, because if they can line up, then the electrons can be conducted in particular in this direction here, okay? So the goal is to line them up. So about the time I was coming to Georgia Tech, I had some students make this picture, which I call a sausage, and it contains a solution of P3HT in it. And the idea would be that the uh, solvent would slowly evaporate from that and force the polymers to coalesce into a line. And so then when we got here, we chose solvents, an easier solvent, more, more relevant solvent, actually a more difficult solvent to work with, but more relevant solvent. And uh, this cartoon was drawn, and what it shows is these sort of like potato-shaped structures containing a polymers dissolved in solution, drying out, and hopefully leading to alignment. And so our hypothesis at this point is that when you do that, you have enhanced properties for the material. And one of the ways that they used to follow this is just good old UV absorption spectroscopy. And so uh, people who are in the conducting polymer field know that this band here, and particularly its ratio with other bands, uh, is an indicator of the alignment. And this is very good alignment. Uh, if you need to see that at a more molecular scale, then that becomes a GSACS experiment, and that also works. But it was a little bit of a surprise that we also found out that you can have these polymers dissolved. Polymers are dissolved in solution. That's all this red stuff here. And you see all these little specks and these little arms 
coming out here look like neurons, right? So if you're thinking that the polymers are you know, conducting, well, that's exciting to have this sort of neuron looking thing here. But the thing that really catches my attention is all the little dots and little things that are blebbing off of this thing. They contain P3HT polymer too. And they give us the opportunity to process it really for the first time, like a latex dispersion. You know, latex that you paint on your wall, the reason do that, instead of the old-fashioned oil-based paints, is you use a lot less volatile organic solvents. Everybody would like to eliminate volatile organic solvents. So what you do is you make part, the oil part that you want in the paint into a little colloidal particle, and you disperse it in water, and the water dries, and you have this nice film. And so it's interesting to think about that kind of possibility for P3HT and other semiconducting polymers. This place has more semiconducting polymers than anywhere. All right, so now what about mimicking this kind of action with a synthetic polymer? Here's a polypeptide that uh, uh, can mimic it. And we're just going to talk about some simple ones. Uh, PBLG is a, a classic polymer. It's the first synthetic polymer that people made that exhibited some of the important properties of uh, naturally occurring proteins. In particular, it's very prone to make helices, the helical shape. And so it's a rod-like polymer. And uh, that's the one that we use. We use the one here in this talk, only this one group here, uh, this benzyl ring hanging off there. So R is a, what you see there. And um, it's prone to make gels. Okay? So if you treat it right, uh, it will make gels. And I've never been clear that this is the best image of these gels, but it's a very famous image of these gels that PBLG makes. And you can see that somehow the rods are lined in kind of a parallel arrangement. And so the basic hypothesis that Cornelia Rosu had was that it would somehow entrap or template the, uh, not entrap is not the right word, somehow you would template onto this linear structure from the PBLG, uh, you would somehow get the P3HT to follow along with that structure in such a way as to enhance its conductivity, okay? So that was basically the idea. So in cartoon form, that looks like this. Um, I'm not sure the scales here are entirely meaningful or accurate, but the idea is that they uh, have the helical shape from the PBLG, and then you have uh, these polythiophenes with their uh, rings hanging off of them in red here, which should be there, and we will get them to line up. Okay? So if the hypothesis that you get that lining up is true, uh, then we would expect uh, to see uh, changes in the UV vis spectrum, just as I've seen showed you before. Uh, you'd expect to see a difference in the DSC, the scanning calorimetry response should change. Uh, there's a technique out there which we don't have at Georgia Tech, which is rare that we don't have something here, but we don't seem to have AFMIR, which is atomic force microscopy, where you also get an infrared spectrum right at the tip, okay, where the AFM probe goes. Put that as close as you want to the molecule of interest, and you see, well, what really is there, okay? So AFMIR, uh, that should show that the P3HT and the PBLG are co-located. And then uh, you're supposed to be able to use SACs and GSACs to uh, see some changes in the system, too. But that's a difficult one because uh, everything scatters. You don't really have very much contrast in the, those experiments. Well, this slide just basically tells you, I mean, I'm not going to step through this, but you, the, the reviewers of the paper did. So we, anyway, um, the, the, the available data support the hypothesis that there's an interaction, okay? A long way to go to optimize that in any kind of useful way, but I think it points in the direction generally of taking rod-like polymers and using them as templates for this other rod-like polymer. Okay. So, Actually, I have now come to the end of my talk. You see the little circle is empty. And uh, if you chose to read the handout that I gave you from N. David Merman, instead of listening to the talk, well, bully for you. Good choice, OK? Um, <laughs> and you would realize that he says, and Merman is controversial. He's a physicist, so he's entitled to be controversial, right? He says, you don't even need a conclusion. Does war and peace have a conclusion? No, but there are book reviews. We'll have a conclusion slide in a minute, okay? But anyway, I'm basically I'm done. If you insist on a conclusion, here it is. Uh, basically, that the proteins and polypeptides, maybe they can be harnessed to do useful things. 
This is an example of a protein that actually, you know, insults and damages trees. Uh, we could try to get money by curing trees, but what would be the point of that? Other people are doing that. Here, we would like to actually use that kind of protein to do something in a material science way and then be inspired to make other polypeptides and other materials that do the same. And so with that, I've hit the end, and I'll take your questions. So the question is to use it as a tag of what? To, to tag some, some like, what, what should I tag with it? Like an enzyme? And then you like, could create vesicles with an enzyme? No, I, we haven't. It's a great idea. I like that because, you know, you, if you're going to uh, do it, it should, it should want to, to go and, you know, sit on a surface, a vesicle particularly. We have sort of a hydrophobic compound. Maybe it'll just bury in there a little bit, maybe. But one of the problems with doing it, with doing anything with this uh, protein, that one stratoalma in particular, is very hard to label it. So we would like to fluorescently label it, and we've tried that for years. I mean, literally years. And I think all of the reactive groups, it has groups that ought to react, but we haven't been able to get them to react in any large amount. So it's a little bit disappointing in terms of fluorescence probably would be good to make that protein and just include something else on it that's even more reactive. Otherwise, I really like that suggestion. Yes? So uh, can you show the hydrophobic molecules stiffening the, uh, the air-water interface? Are yeah. They, are they forming, are they bonding there? Are you having more of those sulfur and disulfide bonds? No. So, so your question is, you know, they, they go to the interface, they lower the surface tension, we clearly see the strengthening. What's the mechanical reason, right? I don't think that they're forming more disulfide bonds. That's over, okay? Um, the, uh, I, I can only offer you sort of pitifully weak answers about that. Uh, what I would say is that they're probably jammed on the surface in some way. Um, we've been thinking, can we, is there something we can pick up in the spectroscopy that shows conformational change? No, not really. Um, um, there are things that you can do to, un -get, to get them out of there. You can redisperse them in ethanol. Um, you can think about circular dichroism experiments where you adjust the temperature and watch for conformational changes. Uh, we haven't done those things yet. And so we really don't have a very good explanation of that. We do know that it is reversible eventually. You, you can agitate them and get them off the surface. By the way, if you get these on a Teflon-coated surface, God help you, they're very hard to clean off. So um, what, what is the thermodynamic basis for forming these kind of cylindrical-like <laughs> bubbles? <laughs> I don't know if I included it in the talk. Let me go. I, I sometimes take this slide in. Let's see what else I got here. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Um, I don't think it's got anything to do with thermodynamics. Okay, so one of the, I teach the MSC 2001 class, and one of the things I teach them is thermodynamics is grossly overrated. Okay, and almost nothing is at thermodynamics. Thank God, we would all, none of us are thermodynamically stable, right? Wrong. So this is just an image of a, a wave curling on the wave. So what we could imagine is that the hydrophobins are here on the surface of this thing and make this much smaller than a real wave. And we just think they just roll up like cigars. Okay, but why that always that that particular shape? I do not know. Okay, I really do not know. But it's a mechanical thing. I don't think it's really a thermodynamic thing because when we pull on with a vacuum, they go to a round shape eventually. You can make them go round, and uh, they won't. They won't. They don't snap back to this shape after that. So, so one can imagine asking if you had a hydrophobin that had a different size, would it form a different shape? Yeah, what a good idea to mix different hydrophobins and see if this happens. So we're often asked, well, that's just one hydrophobin. Do, there's 60 of them. Do, do some more, right? Well, we don't have that kind of money and resources. But the, we have got really two others that we've looked at. And neither of them are as prone to make these extended shapes. Um, one of them will do it, but not very high, not high axial ratio shapes uh, and uh, with much more effort. So we think there's something special about this one. 
but we need to do a whole study of them to see. And somebody's got to pay, so hopefully there'll be a material science application that pays for that. Yeah. If there are no other questions, let's thank Professor Brazil one more time. Thank you. Ah.